Good evening. I'd like to call to order this meeting of the Grandview Heights Board of Education on June 24, 2020. Um, just like in previous months, we're obviously holding this meeting virtually. Um, I'm not going to read the, the complete statement I've read at the beginning of the, the last two board meetings. Um, with this new platform we're trying, part of the reason we're doing that, although we don't have anybody for public participation this evening, this would allow uh, folks that would want to do public participation down the road uh, to do so um, in real life time and, and give us as much as a, much of a sort of real life experience as we can. So I appreciate everyone's sort of patience if we, as we uh, play with the different um, platforms to make this as, uh, as transparent and user friendly for the public as possible. Um, Beth, will you please call the roll? Uh, Mr. Bodie. Present. Mrs. Gebhardt. Here. Mr. Gousset. Here. Mr. Truitt. Here. And Ms. Wasma. I think she'll join momentarily. Uh, we have a rel relatively hefty agenda tonight, so we're just going to get rolling right away. Uh, recognition and presentation. I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Culp for uh, A, B, C, D, and E on that area and a fun one to begin with. So first up we have uh, a Bobcat award for Joe Busimi. So Joe, I'm gonna hand you your award here. Uh, we you grab that. Wow. Oh, there it is. Thank you. Andy. You're welcome, Joe. So uh, first off, congratulations. Uh, Grandview Heights Schools is synonymous with excellence. The district's faculty, staff, and community members have earned the district this reputation. Each employee and countless community members contribute to the overall success of the district each and every day. To recognize the outstanding contributions of the many people who make the district successful, the Tri-Village Rotary Club established the Bobcat Award many years ago to celebrate those who exemplify service above self. Tonight, we are presenting community member local business owner and Grandview Heights Schools parent, Joe Busimi, with a much deserved Bobcat Award. I would like to share a few words from his nominators regarding his most recent contribution to the community. Joe Busimi graciously offered to record and produce the 2020 Grandview Heights High School Commencement Ceremony. He spent 12 hours recording students and did so with a smile on his face and with maximum effort. This was a difficult emotional day for students, but Joe did a great job keeping things light, using humor and being empathetic while still keeping things moving. Not only did Joe agree to record and produce graduation, he did it and he did so with excitement. He was excited to do something for the students and community, which was inspiring to watch. Joe was more than willing to add items after deadlines and no matter what crazy idea we came up with in the moment, he was willing to make it work. The time and attention Joe spent giving students the best experience possible will forever be remembered. We will always be thankful for the countless hours, amazing production, and his excitement with the project. Thank you, Joe. Uh, another one is <clears throat> Joe and his company for all the time and effort they put forth in support of Grandview Heights Schools, and most specifically for the time and effort that they put into the commencement ceremony for the 2020 graduates. The time and effort that was put forth in making Graduation, the highest quality possible for the graduates and their families is admirable. Joe and his company are, company are a benefit to our community and to our schools. I think it's safe to say Joe is a good friend to our community. You know, he also has done amazing videos for the gala that, um, as you know, they're a true partner as well with the schools and support some of the great things that we try and do that are innovative. And Joe is able to capture that through video, the like of which is, it's, it, it's the kind of thing that gives you goosebumps when you watch his videos. He has a, a, an extreme talent. Um, he is a true friend of the schools and it is an honor as your superintendent. And I know I speak for the entire board to give you this award, Joe. So on behalf of the entire school district, our staff, and certainly our board of education, a heartfelt congratulations to you. Thank you so much. <laughs> and Joe, if, if, I, if I can add, and probably not as eloquently as, as Mr. Culp, um, you know, there's, there's not a thing that happens in Grandview, whether it's a celebration or in times of tragedy, that you're not an active part of that 
um, helping the whole entire community. And, um, you know, we discussed this board, we discussed this award um, before some more recent events and, and you know, just, just, it's not about the videos, it's about who you are as a person and what you bring to this community and what your family brings this community. I mean, you are grand you and, and, and it's, it's more than just supporting the schools, you really support the community. And, and in good times and in bad, you're able to, to, to lead your, not only your skill set as, and I don't know if people realize uh, really how high end your company is and, and the work that you do nationwide, but it, it's not about that. It's, a, it's about the person you are. And, and I wanna very just publicly uh, thank you and, and, your, and your family for that. I can't thank you enough, it's, uh, it's an honor. And, uh, and my father would be smiling right now, oh. being the educator that he it, it was. <laughs> he he would he would love this and uh, and think the world of it, which means the world to me. So I appreciate everything. Thank you. I want to add to yeah. just J Joe um, Jesse. The words that you said were exactly the same. I was going to say that it's not just about the school. I mean, here we are as a school, but. The whole community and I know back from Y tribes and um, you know the not just the school but the gala and the support of, of the, the clubs and the athletic clubs and, and everything else um, you know Grandview is a really special place and, and you're one of the people that really make it tick so heartfelt I know you don't do it for you know us saying thank you you do it for the community and you do it for the kids but uh, thank you thank you sincerely I, I do it for this hard hardware <laughs> Acrylic. Yeah. <laughs> Acrylic is fine. It really means a lot that you got dressed up for this event too. Sean. I know. I put my best salmon shirt on. Come on. You know he's so sarcastic, right? He's very humble. Yeah, that's 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 probably the nicest thing I've ever said to you, Joe. Here. I know. <laughs> on video, so <laughs> I, had to, I had to throw something in there. But, well, thank you so much, guys, and I. I Thank you for everything you do too. So uh, it doesn't go unnoticed, at least by this family. And I know many, many others that you might not hear from on a regular basis or especially on social media, but trust me, we appreciate what you do. <laughs> well, Joe, now's the fun part where we probably have a, a pretty hefty agenda in front of us. So you, you are welcome to stay, but we are not offended when you sign off here <laughs> in about 30 seconds. So. Thank you guys. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, next on the agenda is uh, recognition of guests and hearing of the public, of which I believe we do not have any. Is, is that correct? Cor correct. Okay. So next on our agenda is Jay Tadina. Uh, he is our construction manager at risk with the CKE team, and Jay's here to give the board uh, brief update and take any and all questions you might have. Sure. Hey, good evening. Uh, thanks again for for letting us be a part of your your monthly board meeting. Um, very very quickly, what we've accomplished in the last month since our our last board meeting, uh, our work completed. We we've got our concrete foundations installed. Um, as you've probably seen if you've driven by uh, or driven by Oakland. Uh, our masonry towers have been have been constructed. Um, what you can't see is, is there's a lot of work going on in the basement of the high school. Um, we've removed the old boilers that were abandoned to make free for storage space, et cetera, for, for the future high school and for some of the new construction that's going on. Um, <clears throat> also, if you've driven by uh, First and Oxley, you may have seen that we've started the Stevenson Elementary. Um, renovation as well which is which is going as planned and is underway um upcoming work for the next month you know one of the tracking milestones that we've had um for ourselves to to make sure that we're on pace is when we start structural steel and so upcoming is is a lot of masonry bearing walls where steel will rest on that so those must be installed in advance and so we are still on pace. We, we, we've had challenges with weather. We've had, we've had challenges, you know, trying to fit a new school snugly up against an existing school. And 
Um, but the design team has been working tirelessly. Moody Nolan, Perkins and Will, they've been working tirelessly as well. So we, we will be erecting steel in the month of July, maybe the later month of July, but we will be erecting steel. Stevenson work will be ongoing. Um, and, and, and those are, those are some significant um, activities that you'll see. Uh, some some unique items for construction. You know, we were very grateful. I think we mentioned it last month for the gesture from the students. They gave us a great thank you to those tradesmen and women that um, were working uh, during a during a pandemic. Um, so we we're trying to do some community engagement, some staff engagement, some student engagement for this project because that's what it's for. So. Um, Andy and, and team will be putting together, you know, an opportunity for a beam signing. So as we start construction, you know, there will be, a, you know, a beam signing where maybe students or staff or, or, or community can come by and, and, and sign a, a structural steel beam that will hoist, you know, eventually, hopefully as, as school is back in session. Um, we did have a COVID issue, some electrical gear that was shut down for manufacturing from, from COVID-19. Um, has put a delay on um, some electrical gear. However, the, the electrical contractors worked really hard as well as us just to resequence some things so it's not a true impact to the overall completion of the project. And right now we believe that we've been able to absorb those delays, but we will keep the board, we'll keep the district you know, posted at all times. Um, so, and, and then we've been working with Brett Bradley and his team is coordinating our activities so when school starts back up in August that we are as least impactful as, as, as we can be. And, you know, the team is continuing to be engaged. We're, we're you know, pedal to the metal and, and we're working hard to, to make sure we deliver upon our commitments. And that's our update for, for June from hey, the construction do, team. Do you know something we don't about school starting up this in August? <laughs> Let's just say I'm optimistic. Um, oh, one other one other thing, Jay, um, you, you've mentioned in our core team meetings uh, frequently that uh, in your on site central office, I don't know what the right vernacular is, that every board member and person on this call has an assigned hard hat with their name on it and can do a tour. Uh, all they have to do is email that time date to you and, and you or Colleen would be glad to do that. So I wanted to make that uh, make make all the board members aware of that. Absolutely, you all have a hard hat with your name on it, literally, and it's in our in our field. We call it a field office, a construction trailer, whatever you'd like to call it. Um, but yeah, we're ready and we're excited to give tours. We love showing off and showcasing for those trades people that do 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 amazing work. Any any questions that I can answer for um, for the board? Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you, Jay. Um, I guess Mr. Bodie lost some sound, um, but um, Eric, are you back? Doesn't appear so. Um, so next on our agenda is Ryan McDonald. Good morning or good evening, everyone. How's everyone doing? Uh, is the sound fixed there? I think we're okay. Yes. All right. So first I wanna thank the board for the invitation to come and speak before you this evening. Um, as you know, uh, the library has two requests before the Board of Education and we've got a couple slides for you. Um, I'd like to talk about the requests, answer any questions that you have, but also uh, any other questions you have about the library, I'm happy to answer as well. So the two requests this evening, the first is the Granby Heights Public Library tax budget for 2021 um, is the first request. And the second request is the reappointment of Mrs. Deborah uh, Seisinger to the Granby Heights Public Library Board of Trustees. Um, if we can go to the next slide here. So I wanna give you a little bit of background information because sometimes this is confusing uh, for taxing authorities. So quick background information, Ohio Public Libraries are separate uh, political subdivisions in Ohio. Um, the libraries are separate and independent of their appointing authorities. 
And library boards um, have the authority to set budgets, um, define policies, uh, services that they offer in their legal service area. And our legal service area is the um, Granby Heights uh, School District. Um, but uh, since we're funded by the state, anybody in Ohio can actually use us. Um, we primarily get our funding from two sources. Um, the PLF or public library funding that you may hear about. And then of course, the second uh, funding source is the property taxes. Go ahead and go to the next one if we can. So a little bit of background about the PLF funding. Uh, libraries are in a unique position that we are actually able to negotiate directly with the Ohio General Assembly for our funding every year. Um, Ohio public libraries currently receive 1.7% of the state's general revenue fund. Uh, this was previously 2.22% of GRF, but it has been cut or reduced. Uh, PLF funds are distributed to each of the 88 counties. And then within each of the 88 counties, the County Budget Commission distributes to the libraries within that county. So the Budget Commission is made up of the County Auditor, the County Prosecutor, and the County Treasurer. And they do this every year in August. Um, every county does this differently. Um, sometimes there's lengthy negotiations every year. Um, there's different formulas. Thankfully here in Franklin County, uh, the libraries have an agreed upon formula of how those funds are distributed. Of course, this is very different than how the schools are funded on a state level. So uh, this may seem very foreign to you. Um, I think most of you know there are seven library systems here in Franklin County. Uh, thankfully, we have great strategic partnerships with all of those libraries. Uh, the majority of them, along with 17 library systems and seven counties here, are all in our consortium together. And Grandview Heights um, is the administrator for that consortium, as well as the fiscal agent. So we have really great relationships with our partner libraries. Um, if two or more libraries request the formula be changed, this tax budget that's before you well, will be used in that negotiation. We do not anticipate that happening. We anticipate that the PLF will continue to be distributed within the county based upon a formula that's been in place, uh, frankly, for several decades. Uh, we can jump to the next slide here. So I just highlighted a few of the events that occur that involve the taxing authority, and you guys are the taxing authority for the school district. So in May every year, the library board is required to um, adopt a tax budget. Um, it's important to note that this is really our needs budget, okay? Um, or our wants budget. Um, if we don't put the request in, we won't get any more PLF than what we asked for, frankly. Uh, so it's a little different than our appropriations. Uh, then by July 15th, the taxing authorities across the state are required to adopt those budgets. I mean, that would be the school board. And then in July uh, 20th, um, that budget needs to be submitted to the county auditor. The library usually does that on your behalf. And then in August, the budget commission meets, looks at their requests from the individual libraries, uh, uses the current formula to distribute those PLF dollars um, to the libraries unless somebody contests it. Also keep in mind that it doesn't, um, that is what we're estimated to get. Uh, in reality, the libraries receive a percentage of the GRF. So our funding goes up and down based off the economy from month to month. So if general revenue funds on the state drop in May like they did, um, our June distribution is that much lower. And then whatever the revenue is in June, that's what our July revenue is, okay? So we've been seeing between 30 and 15% cuts the last few months, and we anticipate that continuing here for a bit. Um, I believe that is the summary for the tax budget requests. The second request is regarding uh, the appointment of, uh, reappointment of Mrs. Uh, Deborah Seisinger. So a little background about that. In Ohio, uh, library trustees are appointed by um, um, elected officials, okay? So it's usually the highest ranking elected officials within the legal service area. And that would be the Board of Education. Uh, since we serve both Marble Cliff as well as uh, the city of Grandview Heights. 
Um, so there are 251 library systems in Ohio. The vast majority of those are school district libraries. Um, I think we can probably uh, jump to the next slide. So every year, the library board makes a recommendation to the school board for an appointment. Uh, as I mentioned, our legal service area is uh, school district, but there are county district and municipal and association, lots of different types. They all have different appointing authorities and legal service areas. And then I think my last slide for you tonight um, has the motion uh, passed by the library's board of trustees as well as a little bit of information about uh, Mrs. Seisinger in case you don't know her, uh, very active library user and volunteer, as well as advocate for library services. Uh, she is a current trustee, um, a longtime resident of the community uh, at 34 years. She is retired from local architecture firm here in town. Um, she is also a former library employee about 30 some years ago. And of course her children attended the schools here in Grandview, uh, of course they're adults now, but just wanted to give a little background in case you didn't know her. Um, at this point, if there's any questions about these two uh, requests that are before you, um, Mr. President, or any other questions that I can answer about the library and what we're doing. Ryan, oh. I did have a quick question. Jesse, may I, may I ask a oh, quick question? Sir. Ryan, I'm just curious, um, what percent um, of your overall budget is generated by local property tax versus the GRF? Um, it's about 50, 50. Um, it's actually a little bit more on local than it is on state. Cause in, in particularly this year, it'll come out more local because of the cuts and depending on how, uh, the economy rebounds, but more than 50%. Any other questions for Ryan? I just want to take a second to thank you for putting that presentation together. Um, you know, I, I've been on the board a number of years and have been involved in other boards. And you know, this is on the agenda, and people approve it. And, you know, um, uh, you know, a lot because of Mr. Bodie actually said, you know, if we're we're approving these things, I think we should have a really, you know, firm understanding of what we're doing. Not that not that we have any issue with it. Just you know, that's that's our responsibility. So um, I appreciate, and I know the whole board appreciates. Uh, you taking the time to present to us this evening. Uh, can I ask one more question though? Um, I was looking, I was looking, this is kind of in the weeds. Um, I was looking at your budget and I saw that between your 2020 estimate versus actual, you're just about at actual at this point, um, to 21 estimated, you're showing a fairly sizable increase in the PLF. Is that because you anticipate that in the next year or are hopeful that the GRF is going to resume its health? Um, we are asking for the same amount of PLF that we received, that we asked for last year. We do not anticipate that it will, um, uh, that the PLF will be that dollar amount. Um, if it were to re uh, rebound, we would not get it if we didn't ask for it now. So what you see in that PLF dollar amount uh, is significantly higher than what we'll actually get and be able to budget next year. Um, okay. But we ask for it now, and then we uh, demonstrate how we would use it if we got it. Right. So that so that indicates more of what a request is as opposed to what you actually believe you'll be able to use next year. Okay, I got it. Just thank you as well for me. I uh, appreciate the coming out and explaining, and I certainly learned some things tonight. So thank you for coming. Absolutely, my pleasure. And we really value our partnership with the schools. The staff have been phenomenal. We've been doing some really great work together. Uh, we have a really active summer reading club going on right now and several hundred of your students are participating and we're really excited about that. So um, anything that you need that we can help, um, continue to reach out to us and, and we really value that partnership. Yeah, so, thank you. Very educational. And I'll say we love the library. It has been such a part of my family's life for our entire time here in Grandview. So thank you. Thank you. So fun, fun fact, when I was assistant superintendent in Marysville, Ryan was the library director of the Marysville Public Library. And I, I think I got the job in Grandview first, but in short order, Ryan was named the director of the library. So just a, a small, a fun, small. I 
lost Andy there for most of that, but I'm sure he didn't say anything bad about me. <laughs> All right, well, thank you. If there's no other questions for, for Ryan, I think we can, uh, we can move on. Thank you. So next on the agenda is Chris Dice. He's going to be presenting on uh, live streaming capabilities for the board's edification. Obviously, this will lead to um, a decision um, that will be part of the July 8th board meeting. Uh, and, and, and before Chris goes, we are, we, uh, the, the document that we have is still a living, breathing document. And, you know, we're, we're still trying to finalize where it makes the most sense for these, these to potentially go uh, for, for live streaming capability. So, so full disclosure, you know, nothing's final. Um, we're still working through that. In fact, we have a really important meeting tomorrow at 9 a.m. So, uh, Chris, take it. Uh, thank you, Mr. Kalb. Thank you, board. Um, I just want to talk to you tonight a little bit about some of the streaming options that we have. And, uh, you know, we talked about this in the spring a lot as we made our transition uh, to a, a virtual learning environment. And this was, you know, pulling the rugs out from underneath what teachers have done for, for years and decades. And it was, it was very much a challenge, but um, I, we took it head on. And our teachers, we, we were doing virtual PD with our teachers while our teachers were teaching classes. They were picking up new skills. And we, we had a lot of technical challenges. We had knowledge challenges and, and we merged those together to try to accomplish uh, everything we possibly could this spring and working with our teachers. And it's kind of like a Pandora's box. We've opened this e-learning up and we've opened up um, you know, the fact that teachers now are, are generating, creating a lot of digital content uh, for the learning management system. They're working with students, they're posting things to the internet. And so we want to, and I think this actually came out about, uh, from a question from Mr. Bodie uh, about maybe what technical devices or pieces we might need in order to supplement or to make sure we're doing the best possible job we can. So I've been working on um, looking at, you know, why are we recording our lessons and, and what are we doing about that? And so, you know, obviously we have teachers that are recording lessons um, and why are they doing that? They're doing that so that they can post them online so students can watch them either um, in real time if, they're, if, the, if they're, the teacher is presenting to the students right then or if the student for whatever scheduling reason needs to go back and watch it. Or as you know, um, and, and, and this comes from years and years of education, students sometimes ask the same question multiple times or they wanna know things. So having it recorded, having the ability for, for students to go back and watch or rewatch things is very powerful. So as we're looking at the devices and pieces and parts that we could put together to really elevate or potentially uh, drastically improve whatever kind of digital content we can create with teachers, uh, very quickly came to realize one size does not fit all. We will have, uh, you know, what works necessarily for the high school science department might not work for, you know, a sixth grade English teacher. So we're looking at the parts and pieces and technology um, that are versatile, uh, that typically solve more than one problem and have more than one use. So we don't want necessarily uh, one, you know, something that does one thing and, and that's all it does. Um, so we looked at a lot of different uh, tools and devices and things that are out there. And I met with a lot of vendors uh, to talk about setup, to talk about configurations, to talk about management and maintenance, um, and obviously professional development and everything that we would need in order to support our teachers. So one of the first devices we looked at, uh, because we are a Google district and we're using our Chromebooks, is we looked at the Google Meet hardware. And this is a hardware that, uh, that a lot of vendors make some sort of, of virtual uh, meeting specific hardware. And, Google has partnered with a lot of different companies uh, and they've started this Google Meet hardware. And what this Google Meet hardware does is it really elevates uh, the meeting opposed to just using a laptop. A Google Meet hardware uh, is a single device that's specifically designed for virtual meetings. Um, it allows you to free up your laptop for other uses. It also uh, in, in improves the audio capabilities um, if, if in a room or, or a space. Uh, the, the, Cameras on these devices typically will track somebody around the room. So if a teacher's walking around the room, if they're standing here or walking over there, they, the camera can track the individuals. Um, and so they, they would work very well in a classroom. Ideally, they're really designed for conference rooms and uh, you know, business meetings. But I have found evidence of some of these being used in classrooms. And um, the, the price structure on these really start at the $2,500 mark, and they go up from there. They actually go up to four or $5,000 for some of the setups. What we'd be looking at would be closer to $2,500 or $3,000 uh, for a setup for a room, if we were to put one in a room. 
The next item that we looked at is something that I've actually have some personal experience with and I've used with other teachers um, for a few years. And this is something called a swivel. And a swivel is like a softball size hockey puck that is uh, that, that's mechanical. It has a slot on it for you to slide an iPad or an iPhone or, or, or smartphone into. And um, it also has a little, little tiny, um, it, it's like the size of a, a pack of gum. It's what it's called a marker, but it has a microphone built in. And you can wear it like a pendant around your neck. And I know some of our elementary teachers right now that have the uh, audio broadcasting in their classrooms, they wear a similar device. And what this does is that marker, the hockey puck swivel actually tilts the iPad uh, it, it'll pan it and it will tilt it in order to follow the marker around the classroom. So the iPad itself would sit on the swivel, uh, whatever the app is running on the iPad, whether it's Google Meet or a Zoom like we're in currently or some other, uh, some other function, it would track the teacher around the room. Um, again, it frees up the teacher's laptop to do something else. Um, it, it allows the, um, allows the kind of use of the full classroom opposed to just when you're sitting at a desk like right now and uh, as I am and speaking to you. The next thing which was part of uh, the swivel and iPad combination is just an iPad itself. And an iPad in itself adds a lot of value um, to what we have. We do have some teachers right now through grants or other means they have, uh, they do utilize and leverage an iPad in their classroom. And what the iPad does um, is it, it obviously has a lot of apps that add a lot of value to your instruction. Um, they allow for digital recording or apps that allow you to take notes just like you would on a smart board um, where teachers can stand up from the smart board. They can do the same thing um, with an iPad by hitting record on the screen. It captures their audio, it captures all their pen strokes on the tablet itself, um, and it saves it as a video file. You can either broadcast that live or you can record that for a student to watch later. So a uh, very common thing, people are used to Khan Academy videos. That kind of thing is done on a, on, on a tablet-like device, an iPad. Um, it's very easy for teachers to use. Um, and there are numerous apps out there uh, that we could leverage with iPads. Um, like I said, we do already have a lot of these in production. We do manage these with our, our, our device management system. And we do have teachers, specifically math teachers and some science teachers that are already utilizing these to create content. These are some of the apps, just real quickly, that I know some of our teachers are already using or some that we would leverage. Um, we, again, not one size doesn't fit all, so there's some apps here that are similar, um, but potentially used to create content. Different teachers would use different apps. Um, not gonna go through them all, but this just kind of gives you a little bit of an array of potential apps that could help uh, improve creativity um, or creation of content to which students can use uh, or, and, and watch in a digital learning environment, also within a classroom. Uh, another approach is something that, that has been around for a while, and we already have some of these in the district, but we'd be looking at uh, these IPVOs, which are just document cameras. And the document cameras allow you to capture what's on your desk, or you can tilt the camera to capture what's on the wall. Um, it's just another camera um, that would ideally, or uh, functionally, it would have to plug into their laptop. So you're using the software on your laptop to um, broadcast whatever you're, you're, you are focusing the camera on. It really does help if you if you have something you know with notes that you're trying to showcase, having a document camera over that so teacher teachers can record or walk through uh, notes as they are broadcasting those. Very helpful. This is the recommendation. After looking at all these, talking to, to several teachers, and looking at what we possibly could leverage and what we could pop, possibly implement, um, iPads. Since we already manage iPads in the K1 and with some teachers. Uh, we already have that structure down. Uh, it also is a very versatile tool, as we talked about. It has a lot of apps that can be leveraged to create content for students to, to use either in a classroom or in a virtual environment. We would be also looking at purchasing a handful of swivels. Um, and these would be sporadically and strategically placed throughout the school system K-12, uh, where we would need uh, utilize those. Um, Estimate right now is 20. That could go up and down. We would have more calculations to do and more teachers to talk to. Uh, and we still don't quite know uh, what the governor is going to ask us to do. And we don't quite know what we're going to be doing uh, with our students. We haven't, you haven't made that decision uh, yet. So uh, I, would, I would throw out a ballpark number of 20 swivels and probably about 10 more IPVOs. We already have document cameras in the district, probably about 10. So this would add up to 10 to 20 of these. Um, in the district that are that also could be used um, throughout the district. And we could make these out on a checkout basis or assign them to specific grade level teams so they have the devices. So why would we want to add additional 
creation tools. Really, it's a, it's a flexibility. Uh, the tools, all the ones that I just mentioned um, in that last recommendation, they they are valuable tools, whether you're face to face, whether you're hybrid or whether you're in a distant learning environment, all they can be used in all three of those situations. Um, and they add value to the educational setting, no matter which one of those, um, uh, which one of the scenarios that you are currently in. They do improve the teacher option for creating content and they give teachers a lot more options uh, than what they currently have. Uh, they're redundant um, backup devices. And this really comes into play and, and was, was very apparent to us. Apple released a, a, an update for a security patch for Apple devices this spring. And um, our, a lot of our teacher laptops automatically downloaded and installed it. This update broke video conferencing for a lot of teachers. And it wasn't just a grand view thing. Um, the techno technology uh, bulletin boards all over the internet were blown up with uh, people complaining about the, this Apple update that, was, that broke, whether you were on, on Google Meet or Zoom or Skype or whatever you were on, it, your computer basically would just not be allow you to, to video conference. So um, if we had an iPad, that's a secondary, a backup device. So um, it doesn't take much for teachers to get back up and running um, if they're in that scenario. And that's one thing we want to make sure is we want to make sure that we're redundant, that we have a backup, the teachers have something to turn to if, if one of their pieces of technology is not working. Um, and then the other thing is something that we probably all heard of, and that's flipped classroom. Um, the flipped classroom model of creating video content, we have a lot of teachers already doing this. And adding these creation tools really uh, promotes that flipped classroom model, which has seen a lot of success. Um, teachers, students, and parents do like it when, when content is created. It's for students to watch at home, and then they, when they're back in school or when you're working with the teacher one-on-one, -on -one, uh, that's when they can practice and, and get feedback from the, uh, from the teacher. So uh, that was a real quick run through of a lot of research that we've done, uh, but I, I do want to take time to answer any questions that you might have. I got a question. So first, Chris, that's awesome. Uh, thank you. Great presentation. And I mean, it's just kind of thrilling to know that we're in this day and age where this is possible at a, you know, it's not cheap, but it's, it's affordable. Um, you know, 10 years ago, uh, you know, I'd probably just be all out of the ballpark to even consider doing this across the board. So, um, you know, great to have options. I think the question I want to ask you about is, um, so for the, you know, the different models that you had here, including the high end one that, you know, you, you, you aren't recommending, um, or any other ones that you looked at, just, can you talk a little bit about, um, you know, one mode, which would be, uh, you know, the, the lecture, you know, of, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the classroom teacher, um, delivering something and it's content and, you know, just sending out. And then there's the other, which is more of the meeting with Zoom, where, you know, a teacher would be wanting to see who's out there connecting on the internet and having a little classroom management and be able to do discussions and all that. So with this technology, do you see it being good and useful for either scenario? Or is there another one I'm not talking about? Or if like, I guess probably my biggest worry is that, you know, some, we could set someone up to do kind of the more lecture, but it wouldn't be all that helpful in doing the more interactive. So could you just kind of talk about that of how that works with the teaching modes? Yeah, you know, I, I would say that there, it really depends on, uh, you know, the teaching style uh, of the instructor. And as we know, there are teachers out there that are phenomenal lecturers and you've sat through a lecture and it's just like the best thing in the world and you just want to sit through another one of their lectures. And there's other teachers where you've sat through a lecture and that, that's just not, that's not their, the best thing that they do. They're, they're, they do more uh, project-based learning and, and um, things like that. So it, it, there, there's a lot of personality that comes into play here. I would say that this, all of this technology fits the full spectrum. Um, it, it, if you have a teacher that is, if we're still back in school face to face and everything uh, is, is fine, we're, we're, we're working within our standards and every, we, we are taking into account all our safety um, and health, health um, standards that we need to take into account. These devices do have a lot of value in the classroom in addition to what the teachers currently do have. 
um, like I said, we have math and science teachers right now that are using these in addition to the, their, their laptop that they currently have. So they, they do add a lot of value. Flip it to the other end where we go back to the e-learning where what we did this spring, they add a lot of value there too. Now it's gonna to have to come with a lot of professional development because some of our teachers are not used to creating with this content. Um, but Mark and Jessica, you know, our 21st century coaches are phenomenal. They have created a ton of content. They are engaging with our teachers and they are more than happy uh, to jump into anything that needs to be done and making sure we elevate the teachers and bring them up that ladder of, of professional development so that they are comfortable using these tools in an effective way um, to create content for their students. So um, you, you go in the middle and that's that hybrid approach that we've talked about, you know, AM, PM, A, A day, B day, or what, whatever potentially could happen. Um, and again, if, you know, if this era, and, and I'm making, I'm just making this up because we have no idea, but you know, if, if you, a teacher has some students in their classrooms and some students at home, again, these devices add value because it's a second camera. It's a, it's another device where teachers can create content. Um, and uh, you know, as I'm sitting right here, I'm actually logged into two different devices. I'm logged in watching, making sure that the stream is going live, and I'm also logged into you. So I'm I'm using two devices right now. I'm using an iPad and I'm using my my laptop in order to make sure that everything's working. So they these add values in a lot of different scenarios. So I mean that that I like that you brought in the two different devices because I'd heard that for um, one of the limitations, you know, for the, the Zoom type where you have, you're, you know, you're trying to watch 23 mm -hmm. different faces, but at the same time, you're trying to manage content and uh, keep track of things, which is really hard to do. I mean, I know on my work, when I first came home, I just had my little laptop and it drove me nuts until I got, I went back to my work and got my two monitors um, that I'm looking at right now. And they're, you know, it, it, it was so much easier to have the extra monitors. So, which is, you know, a separate camera. So it's all one device, but, you know, that kind of expanded it for me. So I, my the other part of the question then would be, um, you know, is this sufficient? So, um, and I'm thinking of the scenario again, where, um, you know, you have a, a teacher who is teaching um, remotely to students who are remote and wants to interact with them and, you um, uh, you know, have something like we're having now with, you know, seeing everybody and have classroom management and all that. And, um, you know, with this, you know, the one iPad with the laptop, is that enough? Or um, do you see a need to have like extra monitors or anything else that would be, um, you know, helpful for the teachers? We, we, we actually do have a fair, fair amount of of extra monitors already in service around the district. And that's that's a very low cost addition and something that we have in a replacement cycle anyways, uh, in a normal technology budget. So if a teacher wanted, uh, um, we have secretaries with extra monitors, administrators and teachers all with extra monitors, depending on uh, you know how they have their setup. If they wanted an extra monitor, um, it would add a little bit cost of this, but that's also part of a cost that we, we have kind of allocated within our general technology replacement cycle. Um, so it wouldn't be that drastic. Uh, we can we get a really good deal on monitors when you buy in bulk. So um, I'm not too concerned about adding monitors, but I do agree with you um, adding a monitor. And you know, to, to your point, I have my iPad, I have my laptop and I have a monitor right here. So I have three screens um, in order to make sure all of this runs smoothly tonight. Thanks, Chris, for um Pulling all that together, I appreciate that. Um, I'm wondering, do you have any specific requests from teachers for, for instance, for like the Google Meet platform? Um, we did ask that question about technology uh, to our teachers. You know, did they feel like they had the technology at home to to do their job? And 90% of our teachers said yes, which I was very impressed with. I and, and proud that our our teachers felt like that we were. So supporting them. Um, but it's also sometimes you only know what you know. And, and you know, right. if they're not used to working with an iPad and we'd taken it away, then they probably would have said, maybe said, no, they didn't have enough uh, tools. Um, as far as, uh, you know, the um, the platform we're using, a lot of teachers preferred the Google Meet. Uh, we also were using Schoology Conference. Uh, we currently, we were not using Zoom because of some security issues we had with Zoom early on in, um, you know, we, we had an issue where students were able to create 
sessions without teachers present, and we and uh, all of our administration felt that were, probably was not in the best interest. Um, so that's one reason we didn't go with uh, Zoom kind of in, in the early stages. Uh, but Zoom is back on the table now. We're using it to, for the board meeting tonight. Thanks to uh, Mr. Truitt uh, made this recommendation on this feature that I hadn't known about. But um, we are looking at potentially utilizing, you know, leveraging Zoom potentially next school year if we need it. Um, it's hard to beat Schoology Conference and Meet because those are both free of charge. Zoom would come with a fee, but it's, it's, very, it's very small. I'm wondering the the one platform, and maybe I'm using the wrong term. I thought it was Google Meet, but the Google product that was twenty five hundred dollars. Um, oh, I'm so, the 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 Meet hardware. Meet hardware, yeah. Um, gotcha. Do you have? Would there be a? Would there? Be, first of all, have there been any requests? And and if not, do you think that there would be a few staff members if that afforded um, sort of extra advantages? And and you had a few teachers that would try it out, and it was really really cool. And they could maybe present how it worked to other teachers just to get some buy-in. Do you think that getting a few of those might be useful, or is it, or would you rather go with like swivel and kind of just teach everybody kind of the same thing? Well, I think there there there's a lot of uh, you know a lot of people would say, say that consistency really helps. You know, teachers knowing how to use the same hardware so they're helping other teachers. I would say there is a place for the Google Meet hardware, and that kind of was one of the first places I started because. Um, I've been reading a lot about it this last year anyways. Um, we are probably looking at installing some of that in the new construction in, in some of the conference rooms or maybe a couple of classrooms, but it's installation. Whereas in the swivel and the iPad, you can pick it up, put it in your bag and go and take it with you. So if you wanted to take it home or you wanted to take it to another classroom, it's portable. The Google Meet hardware really is an installed device. Mm -hmm. So you install it in a space. So if we had a classroom or classrooms that were dedicated for virtual learning mm -hmm. it might make sense to pursue that but it's not something that you would you know use in a seventh grade teacher's classroom one day and then the next day kind of move it to a sixth grade teacher's classroom so theoretically um, if we did have to go to a, a remote learning situation the swivel could work with the teacher at home absolutely yeah whereas yeah. the google meet hardware would not it's not something you'd necessarily want to take home because there, there's a lot of cable. It's it's a it's a complete video setup. So there's a lot of cables and wires and boxes that all have to be plugged in and configured correctly. Not to say that uh, our, a lot of our teachers couldn't handle that, um, but I wouldn't want to, um, you know, unless they really wanted to, I wouldn't want to burden them with, uh, you know, trying to have that configuration and uh, on top of everything I know that they're trying to prepare for their students. Yeah, I like the swivel just in terms of what we're asking the teachers to do. If we're asking them to do synchronous learning from home, having kind of like almost like a little classroom setup studio, maybe it's in their kitchen or however they're setting it up. It might be really nice to have a swivel. Yeah, the, well, the swivel itself is really, I, I think it's ideally ideal for a larger scenario. So like in a classroom or in a large space, if you're sitting at home and I just have a couple screens, probably just kind of, you know, taking the iPad and propping it up on a stand and having it aim at you is, is more than sufficient. Okay. Um, so that's why I didn't, I didn't have a lot of quantities of swivels um, in, in the projections, because those would be when we, you know, we're recording probably in a classroom where a teacher's standing at this whiteboard, then they got to walk over here, and then they're going to walk over here in, in that scenario. Um, it's a really, actually, I got one back there on, on, on my table that I've been playing with, um, and uh, they, they've come a long way. I think I had one about five years ago and worked with some teachers, and the new model is uh, that much more slick. Great, thanks. Yes. Any other questions for Chris? Yeah, I just want to understand that um, estimate a little bit better. I understand it's it's a rough estimate, and there are a lot of things to be figured out. But when you got to that, tw I think there were 20 swivels in there. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, I'll share my screen again. Hold on a second. Um, so the I'm estimating right now, and this is rough estimates, um, because I know we have some teachers with these and some teachers without these. We're looking about 65 iPads to get to all our instructional staff um, to make sure they have the devices. We might have some staff that, that um, may or may not uh, need to leverage one. Like I said, you know, um, if there are what, what they're doing already is working and working well, we don't necessarily want to force another tool into their hands. Um, uh, so it's 65 swivel or 65 iPads, uh, roughly 20 swivels and roughly uh, 10 IPVOs. The swivels themselves, if, if I go back um, and when I go back here and I, you look at this, the $1,150 is for the swivel and iPad. Okay. 
Yeah, so that would basically ensure that just about every teacher who wants access to an iPad can have it. And then the swivel, is that the number 20 kind of thinking what might be needed if we had a situation where most kids were back in the classroom, but we had um, some kids opting out or unable to attend in-person classes for various reasons, as opposed to as opposed to everybody being at home. Correct. I mean, we, we could estimate one for every single classroom, but I, I personally right. think that might be a little overkill. I think some teachers, like as we're, as we're working right now, or some teachers that were working in the spring, if we went back to e-learning, the, they would be very comfortable just using their uh, laptop as they as they have, and they were very successful with it, and they don't need anything else to continue the success, and the simplicity of that would be great for them, and other teachers would want a little bit more, and again, after you do a little professional development, that's going to, uh, you know, give them the opportunity to learn more about it, and how they can integrate it effectively. Um, those numbers may change. And, and if I may, because I do think uh, if in our discussions as a leadership team, and thinking about more in thinking more about application and less about the device for learning, the more I process and reflect and have discussions, the swivel and synchronous learning in a hybrid model, I think is far more effective. Let's just say 712. I think, you know, K6, K5 that direct instruction that the swivel and iPad provides may prove useful and valuable, but that face-to-face -face interaction and more application of learning and practice and formative instructional practices of feedback is more important. And it kind of, you know, all of you have kind of asked the question, um, but, but device aside, you know, part of what we're talking about is Let's focus on the tool that will help support developmentally best instructional practices for learning. And, and to me, uh, and we haven't landed the ship, okay? We haven't landed the helicopter, but the more I'm thinking about this and having conversations, I think the swivel and iPad solution is probably a better fit for say 712 than, than early elementary. Um, again, we, we th that's just, maybe more information you wanted right now, but all of that impacts how many you purchase, where they go, so on and so forth. That's helpful, thank you. Any other questions for Chris? Um, well, thank you for that. And, and uh, certainly certainly appreciate that information. You know, it's, it's, it's one piece in a, in a relatively um, complex puzzle um, uh, that, that uh, that we're all part of right now. So, so thank you for that. You're welcome. Thank you again for the opportunity just to uh, talk about all this. Nice job, Chris. All right. Um, let me get to the right page on the agenda here. I apologize. I keep looking to the side. That's where my agenda monitor is. Um, we've got uh, minutes from a regular board meeting on May 13th, the board work session on June 3rd, and the special meeting on June 16th. I believe uh, everyone here was present, so I could, I'd ask for a motion for an approval of all three sets of those minutes. So moved. Moved by Kevin, a second? Second. Second by Eric. Beth, could you call the roll, please? Mr. Bodie. Aye. Mrs. Gebhardt. Aye. Mr. Gousset. Aye. Mr. Truitt. Aye. And Ms. Wasma. Aye. Uh, next on the agenda, uh, under reports of the building and department reports, uh, any questions or comments from the board on those building and department reports that are in your packet? If not, we'll move on to finance, Beth. Okay, um, Chris, can you pull up my um, slides? Okay, great. So I have um, incorporated my financial update um, in the slideshow. Um, so uh, next slide. So just some general fund highlights here for the month of May. Um, interest for the month was just under $15,000. 
Um, our tax revenue, um, there's been no change in that. We're just uh, seven tenths over uh, what our annual budget for the year was. Um, state funding, as we talked about last month, there was a um, state funding reduction of 320,495. That was split over our final three um, state funding payments. So our, our second payment in May and our two June payments. So actually that full reduction has been taken. Um, but just within the, the last few days, I think it was Friday, um, the governor signed House Bill 164, which provided some relief um, for districts who had high percentage uh, reductions in their state funding. So that amounted to about 176,000 um, reduction offset for us. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that more here in just a moment, but just wanted to make mention of that. So um, our property tax allocation, no change in that either, um, just over the, the um, annual budget. And our Grandview Yard revenue, our, our TIF revenue, um, I, I think I mentioned at the last meeting that our annual proje revenue projections have been updated um, by Baker Tilly. And with the first half um, settlement for the calendar year, we're at just over 52% of what those 2020 projections are. And again, those are done on a calendar year because that is the, the um, property tax uh, valuation and, and um, uh, tax rate process is done by calendar year. Um, expenditures for the general fund were at about just over 88% and our fiscal year to date budget was about 91.7. So we're, we've done well um, staying within our budget. Um, so just a little bit more information on those updated Grandview Yard projections. Um, as, as we've talked about before, those were updated by, by um, Baker Tilly. Um, that's the firm that helped us structure our bond issue last year and structure that millage model um, to incorporate that TIF revenue into to, um, to subsidizing and reducing that, that millage charge to residents. So they have been with us. Um, they update those projections annually. Um, and that's really, really important because we are relying so much on that revenue to, um, to help offset the, the bond millage. So um, we wanna make sure that we have a real good handle on that. So overall, um, actually Baker Tilly presented to our finance committee um, just about, I think actually a week ago today um, to, to talk through those, those updates and, and um, what changed since last year. So overall, the revenue um, through the life of the TIF, um, and that's through 2040, is about 116 million. The increase um, of the new projections over last year represents about 2.5 million. And there's a number of reasons that those, those um, projections are going to kind of ebb and flow through the life of this TIF. Um, so some of the assumptions that, that have to be taken into consideration um, are assessed valuation and, um, you know, at what rate that changes or increases for, for reappraisals, for triennial updates. Um, really one of the most um, important or, or um, one of the most significant factors is the timing of the build out. So, um, you know, projecting revenue for that that development over the next 20 years, you've got to make a lot of assumptions about when, um, you know, when those properties are going to be built out. And so Baker Tilly does work pretty closely with NRI um, in terms of, um, you know, getting their plans and, and how they see the development build out. Um, but just to, to um, be on the conservative side, typically what they're um, recognizing is a is about a one to two year delay. So, for example, if if the expectation is that a certain property is going to come on um, in, in the year 2022, in the projections, Baker Tilly pushes that back a year or two just just to be um, somewhat conservative and and kind of protect us against any unexpected delays or or um, unexpected changes in in that that development. So um, just kind of a, a short recap, there is the, the full schedule is in the um, board financial packet for this month, but I just wanted to highlight the impact over the next five years. Um, so for, for, and again, these are calendar years, so they'll, 
there'll be slight adjustments incorporating them into our five-year forecast for, for fiscal years. But 2020 is about an increase of 106,000. Um, and then you can see all the way up to, to 219,000 next year. Um, and you can see the last three years from there as well. So, um, so overall, you know, that's, that's very positive news. Um, we will continue to, to um, you know, monitor that revenue and, and those projections very closely. Um, it's something our finance committee, um, you know, spends some time on. And, and, um, and I, again, I do have updates in the, the monthly financial reports as well. So um, the next five-year forecast, I will incorporate these additional revenue estimates um, based on those new projections. So next slide. Um, so a couple highlights for our other levy funds. Um, the bond retirement fund, really there's not a whole lot of new information here. Um, I've included our, our, our millage rate. You can see that has not changed. Um, the interest payment, the first interest payment for 2020, um, I made on May 26th, and that was just a little over a million dollars. Um, the construction fund, um, our interest earnings for the month of May were almost 78,000. Um, and as, as you may recall, um, we, we have a, a relationship with Meter Investments and work pretty closely with them to invest our construction fund proceeds. So the, the good thing um, about that is even though we're, we have seen rates, um, you know, of course, drop significantly in, in the last um, several months, our, our funds are invested and staggered depending on um, the construction draw schedule. So at the start of that project, um, you know, we worked with Concord Addis to get a rough draw schedule and those funds were invested um, according to when they were going to be needed um, to, to pay contractors. So a lot of those investments are locked in at interest rates that are higher than what the rates are, are today. So that's, that's good news. 38.1% um, of soft costs, um, that's architectural engineering um, owner's rep, um, costs, 2.2% of construction costs, um, both have been spent by the end of May. Um, and the fund balance was about 51.2 million. Um, and then the last slide, I have just a couple other quick updates I wanted to share with the board. Um, these are a couple things that we have talked about in, in our last couple finance committee meetings, but wanted to update everyone. Um, as you may recall, um, you know, with the state the state funding cuts, we did get some federal dollars um, that, that help offset that loss. And the, the plan for how to use those funds is about $25,000 for summer intervention services for students this summer. Um, there, there's a couple recommendations on the agenda for tonight for those services. So there are, um, those consist of extended school year, um, for some of our special education students, um, some OG summer work, and then some reading and math intervention. Um, so again, those are recommendations that, that you guys will vote on tonight. Um, and then about 29,000 for um, PPE. That's another allowable use of, of those federal stimulus funds. Um, and those will include, um, you know, the, the um, like the, for example, the plexiglass dividers that, that um, some teachers um, want to use if we return to school. So um, just an update on how we're using those funds, how we're spending those. Um, secondly, the, the, I think I mentioned before that the Franklin County um, the triennial update is um, this year, 2020. And um, within the last couple months, the Franklin County Auditor actually requested the state tax commissioner to delay that. Um, the, the timing of, of triennial updates and reappraisals are, are you know, set in state law. Um, that request was denied. So that triennial update is moving forward. And the preliminary um, value increase that, that has been shared with us is about 16% property value increase for Grandview Heights um, that would take effect next year. Um, now, 16% increase in value is not a 16% increase in tax um, because of House Bill 920, which, which limits inflationary growth um, on our tax levies. So that 16% increase in value, just to give you a ballpark idea, would generate about 2% um, increase in tax revenue for the schools. 
Um, so what that represents is an increase of inside millage. Inside millage is the only millage that can, um, can, can grow with, with value increase. Um, one thing that is really important to, to know though, is that this will impact different property owners differently. So um, depending on how their value changes in, in relation to that average. So it, it's not that every single property owner in Grandview will see a 2% increase in their, their tax bills. It will impact taxpayers differently. Um, so again, this is very preliminary. I do expect that that will drop a little bit just based on past experience with reappraisals. Um, so more to come um, probably later uh, this fall, we'll, we'll have a little bit better idea of where that lands. But I think, it, I think we will see that number pretty close to, to that 16%. Um, one thing that's really interesting, I thought, is that 16% is the lowest in Franklin County this time. So if you remember three years ago, Grandview had the highest value increase in the, the full reappraisal year. And so with this triennial update, we are actually the lowest of, of all the 16 Franklin County school districts in terms of valuation growth. Um, and then the last thing, um, just wanted to show you kind of um, how we got to the, the total um, change in the, the state funding and with, with all the, the moving parts of that. So again, the state funding reduction was about 320,000. We did get Federal CARES Act of, of about 55,000. And then that House Bill 164 um, offset reduction payment, which actually was deposited in our bank account just today, um, was $176,576. And, and so the net reduction, um, you know, considering all three of those changes, is about a, a loss of 89,000 of revenue. So I just wanted to kind of share that. There has not been um, a determination made on, on state funding for next year, for, for fiscal year 21 yet. I was on a call yesterday with um, representative from the Department of Education, and he expects that we will hear something um, within the next week or so. So I will keep um, the board updated on that. Um, Can I ask you a then, real quick question on that last yeah. slide, Beth? Sure, sure. Um, it, not that it matters, I just, for clarity, mm -hmm. um, the, the CARES funding for the summer intervention services, mm -hmm. are those summer intervention service an expense that we typically incur every year, or is that as a, as a result of, of, is that a new expense because we've been closed and those kids need those services? That's a great question, Jesse. Um, and we just actually talked about that in our finance committee yesterday. Um, so um, part of it is new and part of it is, is services that we have provided in the past. So for example, um, I said part of it is extended school year services for um, special education students that have that in their IEP. And that is something that we do every summer for, for students that have that in their IEP. So if we're spending 25 for this year, what would we have spent last year? Um, Ish. Yes. So the, the two new services are the um, stipends for the math and reading intervention. And I think those total 12,000, okay. there, there would be a little bit of an additional cost for, for benefits. Um, so roughly half of that is um, new service and half of that is services that have been provided in the past. Okay. Thank you. Sorry to get in yeah. the weeds there. Yeah, no, no, that's a great question. Um, one last point I wanted to make is that House Bill um, 164, the way that amount was determined was that no school district can lose more than 6% of their state funding. So we were one of the districts that that lost, um, you know, a large percentage. And so um, so not every district is getting that. It's just any district who had, who had a, a um, initial reduction greater than the 6% when you take into account the CARES Act money. So, um, so that's all I have, unless there are any other questions. Any other questions or comments for Beth? I, I would just like to, uh, before we call for a motion, uh, really want to emphasize uh, one line that Beth said, and that's that that property valuation increase affects every resident differently. Uh, being on the board the last time that happened, um, you know, I, I think you are highly likely to get questions about that. There are people's prop, there will be people whose property values increase lower than the average and their taxes may actually drop. Right. 
right. you show because the amount of, in a rough sense, aside from the inside millage, the amount of money we get as the district is the same. It's just divided up differently among the property owners. And, and, and so, you know, one of our most important jobs is putting levy on the ballot and getting them passed. So I think, you know, we always have to explain how that house bill works. Um, but, but you are likely to get that, get that question. Um, and I think everyone here understands that answer. Uh, but, but that's, that's just a, a really critical education point to, to communicate with our, with our residents. And, and um, we are actually working on a, we talked about this at, at our last uh, two communication meetings ago, and we are actually working on a communication piece that we can share with our community um, a little bit later, like early fall timeframe that will help explain that. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Any other questions for Beth? If not, I'll call for a motion for the to approve the May 2020 financial reports and the payment of the May 2020 bills. So moved. Second. Second. Uh, Beth, call the roll, please. Mr. Bodie. Aye. Mrs. Gephardt. Aye. Mr. Gousset. Aye. Mr. Truitt. Aye. And Ms. Wasmuth. Aye. All right, moving on to committee reports. Um, I know some committees have been been uh, extremely active and, and others perhaps not so much because some of the partners uh, may not have been meeting with COVID. So I'm just gonna leave it to uh, who would like to go to go first. I mean, well, I, maybe, I, I, go, go ahead, Eric. I was just gonna say, just because we talked about finance, um, it'd be since we're in the mode or the mood. Let's do it. Um, just real quickly, uh, we actually had two meetings in the last two weeks because uh, there was so much good stuff to talk about. And Beth's done a great job in pulling all that together. So she mentioned some of the things, um, just also to mention um, one thing that we looked at, um, well, I should say, you know, Beth had our uh, consultants look at was um, bond refunding with um, the rates going down so much. We had a question of, you know, would it make sense? And um, if so, when? To think about refinancing our bonds to try and get a better deal for the taxpayers and kind of the bottom line is we can't for like nine more years so um uh they're monitoring it and you know we'll take advantage of it um you know if that's possible but um just the way the bonds are structured that's really kind of off the table for quite a while um also we talked about uh fee waivers uh so that's on the agenda later on um you'll see that um uh, Beth had a really good uh, update on catastrophic costs, which is some money we get from the state for um, uh, special education, which um, is a fairly small pool and getting smaller, but um, it is something that she does every year and we do get some money back. Um, and then the last thing to mention is that we've had some good back and forth on a tool kind of trying to track everything. So Beth presented today all the, the revenue side of what is happening with the pandemic, but there's also the spending side uh, where some of the costs we have that are going up, but there's also some savings of things that are going down. And um, I think it's it's very much a working document. I'm really proud of um, you know the progress. And at, at, you know when that is ready to share, we'll bring that back to the board. Um, uh, especially, I think, you know, the tracking of FY20, um, which, you know, ends in June. So um, I'm sure we'll do a report at, at some point after that um, to, you know, to show what the total effect was. Anything else, Emily, that I forgot? Um, I think between best report and what you just said, that pretty much covers it. The only other thing I can think of, which I think we touched on at a separate board meeting, was that the for the current year, that the second half of the year's property tax settlement is delayed until August. Um, but I think Beth has indicated before that that really shouldn't have a lot of impact on us. But, but I think moreover, it's just important that everybody know like what a great job Beth's doing and, and that we're all keeping a close eye on our financial situation. I want the public to know that, that we're keeping a very close eye on the financial situation in light of everything that's going on and feel pretty comfortable with our health right now. Well, I, I would say, <laughs> I, I would say, you know, sort of from a 5,000 foot view, um, I think uh, not just finance, but many of the committees of the board since, since I've been on the board has, are, are functioning at a, at a very high level. And I appreciate that. Um, and, you know, Eric and, and Emily, with your background in finance, you know, Beth is, 
has made several comments to me on the side about just how valuable uh, she finds that in, in, in those meetings. So, um, you know, it's, it's really sort of a finance team that you guys are a part of with Beth, I think, um, um, you know, is, is really functioning and allowing you to, to dig deep. So uh, I appreciate that. Um, and Andy's that, on the committee as well. So okay. give him credit uh, too. <laughs> So um, I do have one request of the, of the finance committee, um, and, and, and this is just sort of my effort to maybe push things through the committees rather than kind of doing things on our own and doing it in a more, in a more public way. Um, and you may have already talked about this, but I was wondering if, if you guys could take a look at and maybe report at a later board meeting, you know, the, the cost implications of the fact that we charge for half day kindergarten and, and what that may look like. Um, I know that uh, there's been a lot of individual conversations about that, but I think and, and publicly I'd like to ask the finance committee to look at that and what, what the implications would be financially. Um, you know, and there's also an, an educational side of that if, if we would want to ever explore, um, um, you know, doing something different with that sort of fee structure. Um, does, does that sound good? Okay. Um, if I can move on to core team, um, I want to give Mr. Bodie credit. A lot of what Jay presented tonight was um, him really pushing uh, the team to, to give, to make sure the board has a good sense of where the decision points are. And so I thank you for that. I don't really have a lot to add from, from Jay's report and the weekly updates that have been sent to the board. And I guess, I don't know if you want to add anything, Eric, or we can entertain any questions anybody has. No, just a summary, you know, we're on time, on budget, and on quality. So everything is um, going well so far. All right. Um, other committee reports, I don't know if we have anything for policy at this point. I know there's um, a one first read on the, on the uh, agenda that I think Mr. Gousset may speak to when we get to that point. We're meeting Friday to review the next PDQ. Could, could I make a request to the policy committee while I'm, <laughs> while I'm on my roll? Um, you know, we, we've had a lot going on in this country, obviously, that uh, it, it's, you know, it, it, it's one thing for our students to not be learning the content standards and, and we worry about that. But, you know, when, when, there's, when there's civil unrest and a lot of really important discussions, you know, it, it, it makes it that much harder that our kids aren't in school um, having those conversations, and, it, and it's had me thinking and reading a lot, and and certainly this is a would be a minor minor thing in the big picture, but I ran across a policy that Fairfax, Virginia school district, where they allow students excused absences to take part in civic engagement activities, um, and I, I'd be curious. I could be part of that discussion, or if I wonder if the policy committee might. I actually requested that policy from that district, and I have that language I could send to the policy committee. Um, I think we'd want to customize in it. it would look different in Grandview and 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 I had this conversation with Mr. Kalp and he did indicate you know we've certainly allowed students to take part in those sorts of things but I like being it's one thing for something to happen and then we say it's okay I I, I like the idea of you know this is how we operate and this is how we're the things that we encourage our students to do um, and so if, if the board's okay with that I'd, I'd like to shift that to the policy committee to investigate what that language could potentially look like and, and bring that bring that to the board. Hey, Mr. Truitt. Yes, ma'am. I believe um, that the ACLU also says that no student can ever be disciplined for attending something such as a protest, something like that to add it on to. So if you don't mind, I'll look at ACLU language also. And I'll and send you that language, yeah, perfect. Yeah, Fairfax County in Virginia, if it's the, I'm, sure there's only one they have a they have a really good policy because I, I may or may not have tooled around on their policy page but i also wanted to throw that out as well as let the community know that i mean that's the aclu stance that no student can ever be disciplined for attending a protest in that ramification so just to let just to let everybody know that one as well and just as a side note, you know, that that's a huge school district. So I emailed the person whose full time job is in, part, in, in charge of board directives. <laughs> so and uh, she emailed me back within two hours with the policy. So um, uh, just find that, you, you know, sometimes, you know, we're so used to our size, which I think is a, is a wonderful asset. But uh, sometimes we forget. I think. OK, uh, let me. Um, any other committee reports at this time? 
Well, I wanted to say it's not, I don't know if we term it as a committee, but I'm the liaison to the city of Grandview yes, Heights. Please, please. And so I think all of you are aware of these things, but I just thought it was worth mentioning again and showing appreciation to the city that two things that they've done recently since our last meeting. Um, at their June 1st meeting, they passed a resolution of recognition for the Grandview Heights class of 2020, which I thought was really good and um, appreciate them doing that. And then also they had a special meeting on June 15th where they passed a resolution declaring racism as a public health crisis and to recommit to, I'm good, this is a quote from them, to recommit to improving the quality of life, safety and health of residents, workers and visitors who are people of color. And in that resolution, it speaks specifically to committing to making 2021 the year of racial justice learning and partnering with the library, the school district, the board of health and community members to plan a series of educational events. So um, I think you've all seen that resolution. You should have, but you know, just wanted to bring it up and say that I think that's a really great thing. And I and I think I know we've had some discussions, but committing ourselves to um, to joining the city and other partners and looking into that. Thank you. Any other liaison or committee reports? All right, well, we'll jump into uh, recommendations from the superintendent on, oh, I'm sorry, I always do this to you, Andy. <laughs> Skip right over your report. I apologize. Superintendent's report, Mr. Kalp. So first and foremost, I wanted to just reaffirm and thank the board's commitment to giving feedback in last week's work session. We are continuing to sharpen the saw with respect to our Grandview Heights philosophy and planning for learning 2020-2021. Um, you guys all gave great feedback and uh, we're, we're, we are, we have a, we've already met once on Monday and we have another meeting tomorrow at 9 a.m. So when we have a, a, a newly updated draft, we will send that along for additional feedback that will all lead to a July 8th board meeting where hopefully we can get consensus and make a decision about what school will look like this, uh, this fall. Additionally, I am being told, uh, although I've been told that he's going to release guidance before, but I am really being told that he's going to release his guidance and plan this Thursday. I, I do think it important just to mention again that my sense is he is committed beyond, uh, uh, he's very committed to ensuring that this is a local decision and that uh, I think his guidance is going to be relatively general. Uh, I do not think there'll be any uh, requirements. Uh, I think it's going to be very general and left to local districts to make a decision. Um, I think importantly as well for our community and our staff to understand that regardless of what your preference is, it is likely that we will have to be flexible and adaptable and potentially pivot or likely pivot from one scenario to another. So for example, if we're in a traditional setting, it is, it is quite possible or likely that we'll have to go to a hybrid or a full distance. Uh, so just be mindful of that and be thinking about the corresponding contingencies and implications for you and your family. Um, I think is of equal importance, if not more, we continue to work as a leadership team to think about racial injustice and how, as we look to the coming year, we will be able to uh, aggressively and strategically focus on Black history and racial injustice and embedding in our curriculum maps. We're looking at partnerships with other districts that have more diversity. We're looking at a high school uh, class that... Uh, likely will be offered even this coming year. Uh, we're looking at uh, speaker series to build perspective around topics of racial injustice. Uh, I think of equal importance. And um, one of the things that we've been talking a lot about as a, as a leadership team is the importance of student voice and activism and making sure that students are inseparable from what, what we do and how we do it and um, the direction we head as a school. Um, I think now more than ever, their voice in particular with this topic is gonna to be inseparable from the future that we shape. And we have some of the most amazing 
active students that I've ever had the pleasure to work with. And so um, I, I wanted to share that as well. As, uh, as you know, we are in, uh, we, we are providing remediation and instruction in the area of reading and math for our students. Um, there is a virtual week of camp invention occurring. Um, and oh, importantly, eighth graders will be moving into Spanish two. And as well, eighth graders will be taking physical science. And those are two uh, new enhancements um, that we have been planning for for three years. So the culmination of which is next year, it actually will be happening. So uh, while you may not be as excited about that, it's been three years in planning to get us to arrive at that. So that's exciting. Uh, this summer, Grandview Heights school students will have an opportunity to take part of an online social justice and racism class facilitated by English teachers, Bethany Black and Kevin McCarthy. And again, that's happening now. And in fact, um, in short order, you will be receiving an email that will uh, outline a, an opportunity for students in grades K-5 to watch uh, a movie that has been, that deals with racial injustice. And um, that was entirely planned by um, students and recent graduates. So um, that's an example of outcomes when we empower our students, what can transpire in real authentic ways. Um, so in a nutshell, that's my superintendent's report. You know, since Ryan's on the line and, you know, the, uh, you don't need to respond, but I do think Ryan, um, you know, we have a real opportunity as well to partner with the library, the city, um, and maybe even other libraries and school districts to provide real, real authentic opportunities for um, interaction and building perspective, whether it's a speaker series, whether it is partner schools or a combination of all of it. Um, so, so uh, and Ryan has always been so amenable and gracious and willing to partner. Um, uh, I will be, uh, I can make some comments if that's okay about this. Um, yes, please do. We are very excited about partnering uh, both with the cities and uh, with the city as well as the school um, on this topic. We have been in quite a few meetings already in planning sessions with um, all the other libraries here in Franklin County, um, looking at offering a variety of different author series as well as workshops, um, taking a really good look at our collection development strategies and making sure that they're inclusive. Um, we have a long history of offering programming here actually in Grandview on this topic and we want to share that with other districts. Uh, so we're very excited and committed to this. Um, our board is um, I'm thrilled that we're pursuing that. So we'll keep you updated um, as those opportunities arise. Um, but uh, the consortium, all 17 libraries here are, are very committed to this. So let us know how we can help and we'll keep you updated as well as the city. Thank you. Any other questions or comments for Andy? Okay. Um, recommendations from the superintendent action by the board. We do have um, a board policy and procedure, a first read on one policy. And this is actually a, an adjustment of a policy we've recently adjusted um, uh, that, that Mr. Gousset, I think very wisely had some clarification language. Uh, Kevin, do you mind sort of uh, explaining your rationale for the first read and, and entertaining any questions the board may have. Sure. So this is uh, on policy JM. It also applies to policy uh, GBH. Um, and at the last meeting, which was a final read that we ended up accepting, I pointed out that I was a little, oh, almost knocked over my computer. <laughs> I uh, was a little bit unclear on um, the specific nature of some of the language. It's on page 87 if you have the uh, agenda open and it's number 13. Uh, the language that we have currently is staff members shall not groom a student or minor for the purpose of establishing an inappropriate emotional, romantic or sexual relationship. 
And I felt like um, it was a little vague in terms of like the, the emotional relationship aspect is what was kind of throwing me off a little bit. Um, going back through uh, the language that was uh, drawn up by ODE, I thought spelled it out a little more clearly. So the sort of or language that, that we're considering now uh, goes like this. It says staff members shall not engage in grooming a student or minor and then parentheticals, uh, befriending and establishing an emotional connection with a student or minor or a student's or minor's family to lower the student's or minor's inhibitions for the purposes of an inappropriate emotional, romantic, or sexual relationship. Um, I feel like that just spells it out a little more clearly, which is why I suggested, yeah. And I appreciate you doing that. I think that that makes a lot of sense. And I think the alignment to the language of the department makes a lot of sense too. So I appreciate catching that. Any questions for Kevin? Well, this is a first read at our next regularly scheduled or regular board meeting. We will have that as a, a final read and vote for approval. Um, okay. Under business and finance, we have 19 items, which um, includes uh, several of the finance components that Beth has, that Beth has talked about and uh, the Grandview Heights Public Library tax budget and Grandview Heights Public Library Board of Trustees um, reappointment. So could I have a motion for business and finance B one through 19? So moved. Moved by Mr. Bodie, a second. Second. Second by Mrs. Gephardt. Any questions or discussions on those items? Beth? Mr. Bodie? Aye. Mrs. Gebhardt? Aye. Mr. Gousset? Aye. Mr. Truitt? Aye. And Ms. Wasmuth? Aye. Uh, under personnel, there are, are 14 items. Um, I know some of these are, are some of that CARES Act funding at, at work, servicing uh, and working with kids this summer. Um, could I have a motion under personnel C1 through 14? So moved. Is there a second? Second. second. Um, questions or discussions on those 14 personnel items? Um, Beth, can you call the roll, please? Mr. Bodie? Aye. Mrs. Gephardt? Aye. Mr. Gousset? Aye. Mr. Truitt? Aye. And Ms. Wasmuth? Aye. Um, we do have a, an item for executive discussion or executive session, but before we do that, uh, we have items for discussion. Um, the date of our next board meeting is uh, July. What's the, what's the number on that, Mr. Paul? July 8th. July 8th, and I had mentioned at the last board meeting, I wanted folks to think about, and, and um, certainly not proponent either way, really. Um, I, I do know that some school boards are starting to uh, socially distance themselves as they meet and we'll have tables eight, 10 feet apart. Um, and so I didn't know if we wanted to do that next work session in that manner or do it virtually. Um, honestly, I'm sort of on the fence and could go either way. My thought is if there's a single person that's uncomfortable gathering, we just do it virtually. <laughs> um, but I, I just felt like rather than me just determining that, I, I wanted to have a little discussion with the board to see if anybody had a strong opinion either way. I agree with you, Jesse. I, it seems to make sense to me if any, if there's even one person that doesn't want to meet, then that makes sense to me. Will we be able to find a way? I don't, I honestly have lost track of all the various uh, gubernatorial orders, but are we able to find a place that would not only accommodate those of us that are at every meeting, but um, public who would want to be there? So, so my thought process, and, and I have not talked uh, with with Andy or Beth about this, so correct me if I'm wrong. Is that uh, you know we we would try to find a large room uh, could potentially be a gymnasium or a commons. You know we would space ourselves out at tables, and we've done work sessions before. You know we've actually sort of sat around a conference table, and the, the public has sat at tables that were lined up. So we would essentially, you know, create our circle, and then we'd have we would have. We would just have to have chairs that were socially distanced from each other for people that wanted to um, observe that session. And, and depending how spaced out we were, we might want to use that sound system so anybody that came could physically 
could hear us. You know, if, <laughs> if we're talking in this circle and people are 50 feet away, then that sort of defeats the purpose. Um, so that would be how I would envision it. And um, not a board meeting, but I was part of an in-person meeting and that's sort of how we did it. We each had like our own table and we stayed away from each other and didn't use the, the, the facilities. And, you know, talking through this, I'm thinking, well, maybe just do it virtually. <laughs> but well, yeah. like my personal thoughts, I, I, I would love to meet in person. I feel like meetings go a little bit more smoothly that way. But with that said, I think that word is out on this July 8th meeting and that there's a lot of interest in it. And so I wonder if for everyone else to be able to see it, um, if Zoom is perhaps not the easiest way for, for the rest of the community to be able to be a part of it. I don't know. I'm going to go ahead and back up what uh, Ms. Skeppert said too. I've already gotten a, a wild amount of emails. I think that this could be a very high and rightfully so very high attended meeting. Um, one question, Mr. Truett, you said this is a work session. Is this a work session or a board meeting? Well, or it's a board a meeting, but it's not a regular board meeting. So we tend okay. to not add uh, items on the agenda. Um, you know, we, we don't, we typically haven't filmed those. I mean, we can, we, right. we, we don't do public participation at those. I, uh, I, since it is one of those that it, I don't, contentious isn't the right word, but it's, I mean, we're, we're deciding what's going on with a fair amount of the community. I think Ms. Geppert has the right idea with it. I would so love to meet in person. And as I've had technical difficulties all tonight, um, I think virtual may be the way to go with the anticipation of there will be a lot of the community that wants to participate. You know, if we have a hundred people, can we socially distance a hundred people in a gymnasium? So I think as much, I trust me, I, I long to hang out with people. I well, think that another, another opportunity and, and, and I mean, I'm, I'm fine. I mean, it's selfishly easier to do this virtually. Um, I do know a school district where the board met in a room and they just live streamed it in a, in like the gym next door. Cause, because people aren't participating, they're watching, you, you know, regardless in other words we could sort of be in person and uh it could still be live streamed to, to watch just like if you log into a zoom and people I like that option I, I don't like that option I, like that option. I kind of agree with molly on that one i think either we should all be together in person audience included or um you know do it virtually and I, I, I kind of like the idea of um, the ease and right now with virtual and that makes sure at this time that everyone can participate. So, okay. well, then I it sounds like we have our, we have our, I, I mean, it's, if everyone's comfortable with that, no one has objections, I'm, I, I say we move forward with that. We needed to physically know for the, for the meeting notice <laughs> to go out how it, how to operate. So, um, so I appreciate that feedback and um, um, we'll go, we'll go from there. Um, any other items for discussion before we go into um, executive session? Uh, and just for uh, public that are watching, we, um, we will not take any action outside of executive session or have discussion except for the uh, meeting adjournment. So if I could have a motion to go into executive session for, I apologize, I'm looking over. Uh, for number four, um, really about negotiations. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Um, Beth, can you call the roll, please? Mr. Bodie. Aye. Mrs. Gephardt. Aye. Mr. Gousset. Aye. Mr. Truitt. Aye. Ms. Wassmuth. Aye. Are we logging into a, a, a different link for the executive session? Is that correct? Okay, let's, um, I, I want to get this done. I think it should be relatively short. So um, maybe uh, three minutes if you need to run the restroom and then we'll get going here, okay? <laughs> 